Welcome to TSG Live Model Railroading, a program to share ideas and ask fellow modelers about their approach to the hobby. Sit back, relax, and prepare to be inspired. Okay, everybody. Like the guy said, prepare to be inspired. Hello, welcome. This is the first episode of TSG Multimedia's Model Railroading Live or Live Model Railroading. In this program, we're going to showcase the work of model railroaders and hear how they approached their various projects. You know, what kind of considerations had to be made? What were the obstacles? How were they overcome? to produce the desired results, you know, that kind of thing. Our first guest model railroader, who will be on here in a minute, is Rob Spangler from Utah. And I have some photos here that I'm sharing from his layout. I first met Rob in 2019 and got to see this uh, amazing Western Pacific 8th subdivision layout in person. And the layout, as well as Rob's modeling, have been featured in all the major model railroading magazines and rob has also given clinics at model railroading events as a matter of fact i sat in on one of his clinics that was about painting backdrops at the national model railroad association's national clinic or national convention in 2019 that was in salt lake city and so with that uh, let's bring rob in and uh, we'll get started good morning rob morning john how you doing, man? Pretty good. Excellent. So what would you like to talk about? I mean, I know the answer to the question, but let's let's tell everybody what you'd like to talk about today. Well, sure. Um, my idea for our show today was uh, discussing building a signature structure for your railroad and uh, to share some ideas on modeling from photographs, um, using the internet to fill in some gaps in your information, your knowledge, and uh, on how to create something out of uh, stuff you might just have sitting around the train room. Right. So we kind of got started on this during the layout design panel discussion a couple of weeks ago where you were talking about signature industries, mm -hmm. but we didn't really have time to go into much depth on that discussion. So this will, I guess, serve that purpose. And yep. I, I got to say, uh, looking at the layout, and just being reminded by watching the pictures here a minute ago, you have quite a few signature uh, industries on your layout. So which one are we going to talk about here today? Uh, the one that we're going to talk about is one that did not exist at the time those photos were taken. Uh, it's a large flour mill. Uh, oh, cool. One of the photos that you had at the beginning of that little slideshow showed a, a big Walther's grain elevator in the background. Okay. And, and I got tired of looking at that thing because I'd kit bashed it when uh, Walters first came out with the ADM elevator kit, you know, a few decades ago. And it served its purpose. And I wanted to have something that was, you know, different. Uh, and uh, last year I had a few weeks where I needed to do something for a COVID project so I wouldn't go nuts in quarantine. So uh, I decided to use that opportunity to build a new industry to take its place. Excellent. Okay. One other thing that I've been thinking of this week as I've been kind of preparing for this show is your signature industries are large. And I know that was part of the, the whole idea behind right. it. So does it really apply mostly to larger layouts or do you think that you could put oh, a signature no. entry on a, on a small? No, any, any size railroad can have something that's just a, a, a key thing that draws your eye. Um, it can be, you know, a little uh, shack at the foreground of the scene that just has some eye-catching detail. It doesn't have to be a big, complicated project at all, and it doesn't require any particular size railroad. It can be, you know, a little modular shelf in your uh, home office, for all that matters. So really, signature scenes is what we're talking about, not, sure. not particularly industries. Yours just happens to be an industry. Right. Mine just happens to be one big industry, but it can be, you know, whatever you choose to do on your railroad. Right. Okay, cool. Also, uh, something else that we should probably let the viewers in on is sort of a little bit more about the layout. Uh, you started it when, and it was built mostly for ops, wasn't it? 
Correct. The railroad was started in about 2009, uh, and it the original purpose of it was to support operating sessions. So it started operating before a lot of things in there were done uh, uh, visually, and it used a lot of structures that were left over from prior railroads and so on just to kind of fill scenes up until I could take time to replace them. And this was just one of those replacement projects. Did you build your previous layouts knowing that they weren't going to be your dream layout? I just built them because I wanted them to be there and to have something to operate and because I enjoy the creativity and having a layout that we can, uh, you know, have everybody over and run on. Um, not, they weren't necessarily planned to be disposable. Uh, but, you know, since we decided to move and uh, build ourselves a different house, you know, didn't mind getting rid of the old one and, and moving on. Right. So during normal circumstances, you have regular op sessions? We do. How many people normally would come to operate? Uh, it varies from around 8 to 10 usually. Okay. So just to give people an idea, the, the scope and size and purpose of the layout, I think, can give some context to what we're going to be talking about here. So so let's right. talk about this, uh, this flour mill. Okay. Uh, if you want to put up our screen to start looking at this thing sure. got a prototype photograph of the structure that inspired me this is in ogden utah it was built i believe in the 1920s as spiry flower um, you can see that the portion of that that uh, is closest to the camera here uh, that's the part that currently loads rail cars in front of that low one-story portion of the building and then there's an elevator that receives grain and stuff in the background there's track in between the two sets of buildings and this is a very distinctive structure. Ever since it was built, it has had this uh, bright white color with uh, bands of gr uh, red brick. And you can see that as the darker shade in the black and white photo. But this is a very signature building in Ogden. Uh, the Union Pacific Roundhouse, where the big boys and then later the uh, big blow gas turbines were serviced, is directly on the other side of this thing. Uh, behind that big elevator and it used to have a big spiry flower sign on it that was visible from the west so this is a very much signature building from the ogden area so even though i'm doing a fictitious western pacific railroad anybody who's familiar with that part of the uh, of the west should know that building and be able to pick that out on the layout as being inspired by this prototype Okay, a quick question. So really what we're talking about when we're talking about signature scenes or signature buildings is something that's obviously recognizable. So if you drove into Utah, you would see this and be like, oh, we're in Ogden. I mean, if you drove into Ogden, you would see this building and say, oh, we're in Ogden. That's really right. what we're talking about. Right. Okay. I just wanted to cover that because some people watching might wonder what a signature scene is. Yeah, it's so. just something that's recognizable, and it doesn't have to be a prototype. It can be something that's just very recognizable from your model perspective, something that people associate with your railroad. But for this, for this purpose, it's uh, inspired by this prototype. Right. Excellent. Okay, let me shrink this down so I can actually navigate through here. Uh, this was a photograph I took of the building as it existed just a couple of years ago showing you know the color scheme and notice the differences from the previous photo um, compared to the historical picture notice that nearly all of the windows are filled in and this happened you know sometime in the you know last 40 years or so but we can see that where there used to be these big windows there's now just a relative few of these small aluminum window units in here. And you can see off of one side, there's a lighter color and off the other side, there's a darker color. So there's a screen on there and so on, something to reproduce. Um, we can see uh, three stories up where there's some older brick fill in that has a different texture than the rest of these filled in openings. We can see some vents in the walls. And the, the one thing I really like about this structure is how it has all this architectural detail that you don't see on buildings anymore. Um, it has the, the cast concrete with all of the relief and the trim and so on, and this uh, freeze detail across the top that has the, all of the, you know, the red trim in it. It just makes for a very distinctive building, certainly more distinctive than another just white painted plastic grain elevator. Yeah, for sure. Can you go back real quick to that original picture? I just want to see those pic those uh, windows again. 
Sure. Okay. So the big, the big industrial windows that were very common with the daylight factory style from the first few decades of the 20th century. Right. Those are all the windows that get rocks thrown at them and busted out over the years. I see why they changed them. Right. And, and they're inefficient for keeping uh, the building heated and so on. And so I can understand why they got rid of about the only ones that are left are this first row right here in the middle on this uh, lower uh, structure. Cool. And they're, okay. and and they're painted over now. I'm sure we'll see those on the model, right? You will. So here's what we're looking at today. And here's what I was just referring to with the painted over windows or blocked out somehow. You, they're obviously still windows. And then there's these vents cut into them. And we can see that there's this loading shed thing that's been thrown onto the side in uh, later years. And, and since the first batch of uh, photos that I had of the, the building, this truck loader has been added. And I chose not to model that. But you can see all the piping that's going on here now. Um, there's vents and so on on the roof. And I this is the best shot I had from ground level of this thing because it's way up here in the air. I wonder what, what's that? We'll get to how that was figured out and modeled. But, you know, representing the passage of time and all this extra stuff that was changed over the years um, is part of what made this an, an interesting project as well. Part of the problem with modeling is that you can't get necessarily the viewing angle to get every piece of information that you might want. And uh, things like Bing Street View and Google Street View are great to fill in the blanks because you can get screenshots because uh, anymore, the angle that I can see the vent structures on the roof is visible from the middle of a very busy street. And uh, Google Street View gives me a good look at that or Bing Street View. And I can see here a little better um, look at the uh, dust collectors and so on that are above this building and a little better angle on this corrugated thing that sits on the roof over here than I could get, you know, because I certainly wouldn't want to stand in the middle of that street and take photos. But, you know, if you can find it on the Internet somewhere, you can use it. This also shows where the pipes come from this dust collector into this uh, upper stories of this building here on the left as well. The challenge is you can't. Oh, I see what you're where you're going with this because the challenge is you can't see the backsides of those things. Right, and I chose to model this as a flat against the wall, so I cut it off. Uh, but notice this building's kind of narrow anyway, so the building flat doesn't necessarily cut that much out of it. But um, things like satellite views can give you ideas of where all of the roof details are oriented. You can get what uh, an idea of what the roofing material is. Um, we can see the color of the roof from here, which we can't get from any of our normal photographs we would take from ground level. We can see the arrangements of the pipes going into the loading shed. Um, you can see where there's this little conveyor thing connecting these two structures here. So all kinds of information on figuring out a model can be had from different sources on the, the net if we just start looking for them. Um, one of the things I wanted to know was what really are all these structures that are on the roof? I'll go back here. Like this, if you can see where the mouse is going, this uh, thing sitting here and this thing sitting over on this other building. And I didn't really know exactly what those were to reproduce them. Uh, and these figure pictures are pretty grainy. If you've ever tried to blow up a satellite view from Google or Bing, they get pretty grainy when you get down to the ground. So detail isn't very visible. So I, I just started to do web searches for uh, flour mill dust collectors. And I found out that these things are called bag house dust collectors. And once you know bag what it's house. Called, yeah, bag house, which, and if I blow this up, this illustrates what goes on in there. There's air that comes in. There are like fabric uh, bag things that hang in this dirty air room. And as the air gets sucked in, the dust gets collected in the bags. It's like a big vacuum cleaner that's stationary and mounted on a roof. Um, so there's a blower unit that goes along with these things. You can see here is the dirty air inlet, the dirty air room, and then the clean air room. And we can see there's a safety cage, a ladder, and an access door. Well, this starts to fill in information that we can. I can kind of see, if I go back to the other photos, that the things on the roof of this building have... Um, this stuff on them. Oh, Alvin says in the comments that his dad worked for the company that owned that building. Hey, cool. 
um because it was for a while uh part of the same outfit that owned a flour mill in salt lake city but something like this you can actually kind of model from more than a really grainy bad photo yeah that's pretty clever so you've actually you figured out what to search for how did you figure out what to search for on on the internet like did you already know it was no i didn't a- i just i started with generic search terms i had flour mill dust collector and very soon i started to get web hits that said they're called bag houses because the the diagrams like this one are from the outfits that sell them oh i see so it's marketing that's great marketing material as a resource very good right. and then i can find other photos that have detail of not necessarily exactly the one that I'm working on, but ones that are similar enough in function, because I can compare this to the satellite view and see that all of the elements that are in this picture are in that satellite view. I can right. see that here's what the thing looks like as a unit. It has these um, standing seam metal sides. It has a bin. There's this uh, blower unit, this uh, attachment that kind of looks like HVAC parts from your house, really that hooks into this uh, blower down here. There's a blower motor and a pulley unit and an exhaust. Uh So all of this stuff, you know, is useful for modeling because I can see something like, hey, that looks a lot like a Walther's blower unit. That looks a lot like some parts from Walther's piping kit. And this looks like some evergreen standing seam metal roofing with some wider spacing than what my prototype had. So, and some, uh, maybe some evergreen or plastruct H columns for the corner. I got a squirrel comment. It, it's a giant vacuum cleaner, like you said. That's exactly how vacuum cleaners work. It is. <laughs> so, and you know, and the Google results, you know, bring up pictures showing what the function of the thing is. And once you know how it works, kind of, you can make a model that's that's credible because you know what parts of it to, uh, you know, to reproduce. Yeah, very cool. I, I like that. You can, and plus knowing. Like you were saying, you know, the Walther's kits and or the Walther's parts, you know already from your previous experience in modeling what types of things you can add to your model to get this look. That's Yeah, that's and great. since you brought that up, I think I'd re- in this presentation remiss in not mentioning a couple of the people that inspired me to do this. And there's information on these guys that's out there for those of you that are watching that, you know, if you're thinking, well, I've never just built a structure from just stuff I have sitting around. Um, Art Curran, who wrote the kit bashing articles uh, for Model Railroader for many, many years, and I think it most, a lot of these articles have been collected into a book that uh, MR will sell you. Hmm. Um, he talked about using all his junk out of the scrap box for uh, building details and turning something into something it was never intended to be. But um, once you start to see people use that process, you can then figure out how to use it for yourself. Uh, another huge influence for me was uh, John Narich, who's the uh, person who scratch built so many of the structures for the NEB and W uh, model railroad at the Rensselaer Institute in New York. Um, things like how to make a cornice for uh, a 1890s business building out of ties from N scale Atlas track or something. And it's like uses for stuff that you wouldn't think of necessarily because it's not necessarily even intended to be structure parts. But um, if you just have somebody that shows you a few items like that, you can kind of get in your head the process and then be able to do it for yourself. Right. So to start working on the building, I developed a pretty sketchy plan here. Um, This was drawn onto some uh, just some typing paper um, using a scale ruler and some dimensions that I guesstimated from the building and from what parts I had. Um, I did have some Grantline eight pane wood windows that looked like they were about the right size to be those two pane metal windows. So I figured out how big they are. And then I printed off uh, the pictures I took of the building from the side and sort of scaled from that saying, okay, what percentage of the size of the opening in the building is the window? And if I just do some basic math, I can figure, okay, this is this space here is 10 or 12 feet and then therefore if i you know start taking some more measurements off the the photo and do the math say okay this looks like it's about 12 feet and i can compare this to other structures i have on the layout to scale it so that it looks like it's going to fit in with other kit bashed or kit built buildings i have so i came up with a spacing between floors 
of around 12 feet and the spacing um, side to side that gave me a building that fit in my scene, I realized if I made it the full prototype size, it would be a bit too tall to look right with the other buildings in the scene and a bit too wide. So I took a couple of vertical columns of windows out and I took a story or two off. But right. so, um, so instead of compressing the size of them and making it look like it's farther away, you just removed them. I, I like that. It's well, it's selective compression, right? Right. Because you, you can only compress the size of the elements so far to where they look like they're out of scale. And right. so it was necessary to remove a story rather than squish a story down or remove a vertical column to avoid making it to look too small. Got it. Part of the proportions that, that are necessary to make the model look right or think the size of the window unit versus the size of the space in the wall that it occupies. Right. I want to say something real quick. We, we do have some questions popping up from time to time on the bottom, but we're also going to do a, a Q&A toward the end. So if anybody doesn't get their questions asked, don't worry, we will have some time for that at the end. All right, Please John, if I, get, if I get talking, looking at my other screen here with the, the images, you know, make sure you stop me if I need to answer something. So. Oh, you know, there was one that popped up here a couple seconds ago. Let me see if I can find it real quick. Uh, oh, there you go. Oh, CAD. Uh, I'm too dumb to use CAD, I just, and I'm an old dinosaur, so I just use a scale ruler and paper. Literally, everything that I do is just drawn out on paper. It's quicker for me to do. And um, yeah, if you had a drone, you could scope out some of the stuff on the building provided. Remember, I'm in Utah and everybody has guns. So drone, <laughs> you know, you're taking your life in your hands with the drone. So well, you're taking the drone's life in your hands. The drone, yeah, the drone, the drone. <laughs> well, then they come and find you and shoot. You next. <laughs> right. <laughs> How much research goes into the industry? It depends on this one. It took me, I don't know, maybe a week or two of looking around on the internet and looking at photos and deciding what I wanted to do and then drawing it out and, uh, you know, transferring stuff to plastic and then going back and forth. It, this is a big, complicated industry. If you're doing something smaller, just maybe a few days of messing around and you've got it. You know, it really depends. I, I do not have 3D printing for anything on this building. There is some laser cutting on this building, and I'll show you that in a little bit. So if you got a friend with a laser cutter or a friend with a 3D printer, they can uh, help fill in some blanks for sure. What if you don't have any friends? Then uh, then you need <laughs> to buy that stuff yourself, John. So, <laughs> I'm just asking for a friend. Wait. Yeah, oh, right. So, yeah, it, 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 the, the fewer friends you have, the more expensive this process does become because you need to do right. it on yourself. <laughs> so anyway, um, I transferred the dimensions from my drawing onto some styrene. Um, for use in these big structures, I like to have uh, four by eight sheets of styrene. Um, if you look in, uh, you know, your local white pages, internet site for plastic suppliers, uh, most larger cities are going to have some place that sells plastics for people to build signs or commercial displays. And um, a sheet of 60 thousandths that's four by eight feet will set you back maybe 35 bucks. Um, similar price for a sheet of 30 thousandths. Um, getting really thin stuff like you get from Evergreen or Plastruct is a little harder. But as long as it's 30 thousandths and bigger, it seems to be pretty readily available. They can ship it to you. Uh, rolled up in a tube, or uh, in my case, I just drove over to the place and got it and rolled it up, put it at the back of my truck and took it home. So the the wall of this building is bigger than what you can get like off of an evergreen sheet that you would buy at the hobby shop. Um, so that's why I like having the, the big four by eight sheets to work with. I just put them on the floor of the train room and start marking things on them from there and cut them out. So this was sort of a proof of concept to see if you know, once I had the dimensions on here, how did it look with the other buildings in the scene? Um, did it did it work well with the parts I had available? And you can see some different parts here. So here's a, a gray roll door that it's the right dimension side to side, but it's too tall. It's from a Great West Models kit that I have left over. Is it? Yes, this is HO scale. Thanks for the question. Um, I have a, a door from a micro engineering building here that I kit bashed into a double door. Uh, there's the horizontal grab bar like the prototype had on one side and the transom up here that's another part of a microengineering window a pike stuff door left over from a building here so we got three kits worth of leftover stuff um 
that I tried to dimension out and see if they would work on here. So once I tested it out, knew everything was going to start looking right, I could then start cutting out the openings and, and working from there. So this is that very same piece of plastic with the door and window openings cut out of it. Um, and you can see I'm starting to build up laminations here. You know, the prototype structure has all of this concrete architectural detail that was cast in place. And so I've got some 30,000 styrene. The reason why some of this is a little discolored is this, this sheet of uh, four by eight styrene I've had for 30 something years and it's discolored a little bit because of where it was stored for a while. So, you know, it's cost effective to buy this stuff because you have decades of modeling that you can get out of it. Yeah, I was going to say that. I, I think that's a really great tip for anybody that wants to do this stuff on a budget. I didn't even know that uh, you could buy plastic in four by eight sheets like that. It's yeah, like it's plywood. Cheaper. Yeah, that's a, and plus you get the size you want in case, you know, Evergreen doesn't make that size. I think it's a, a really good tip. Yeah, and then the, the little stuff here is Evergreen strip because it's, it's easier to work with, you know, little narrow pieces that are already pre-cut. Right. So... And I left space in here for the uh, the brick inserts that would come later. And since this is uh, being modeled in a more of a modern day configuration where everything is just blocked in, um, you know, things like a window opening may only appear in this this lamination, and then the sixty thousandths that's behind it um, just stays there to represent the area that's been blocked in on that window. So as we keep going. Um, more things like 30 by 100 styrene goes here. Uh, additional laminations of the the big sheet. You can see the cut the the sort of yellowish colored stuff is the big sheet that I was cutting it out of, and the white stuff is evergreen. And we can see here now that since all of these are just going to get painted white because the whole building's one color anyway, I started to get these pieces glued in. Um, I mentioned earlier there were the areas that were bricked in that had a little different texture. It looked like they were bricked earlier than some of the, the later fill-in that was concrete block. I had some brick sheet that had been sitting around that I used here. You can use, you know, the old Holgate and Reynolds or you get if Walters or Design Preservation or whatever you have. So those have been laminated on. And I just keep adding layers until I have the, uh, the effect of the prototype from the photos. Food tools and methods. Thanks, Blaine. Um, my main cutting tool for this is a Stanley utility knife. I could use to cut sheetrock. A big knife. I use. I rarely use a small exacto knife for any of this. And for cutting big pieces, I have a uh, a four foot long aluminum T square that's designed for cutting sheetrock. So if I throw that under the edge of my uh, big piece of styrene. I've got something to run my utility knife on and make the cuts. And then I just scribe and break. Um, some of these things, like the little openings here, I might drill holes in the corners and then snap and break these out. But uh, the majority of it is just scribe and break with a big straight edge and a utility blade. Are you uh, gluing with CA or are you using some kind of a liquid plastic no, cement? No, all of this is glued together with uh, MEK from a, oh. a gallon can that I got at Sherwin-Williams. And since I got that gallon can, MEKs, depending on what state you're in, is a lot harder to get than what it used to be. Um, so there are other glues that you can try, but solvents work the best, I think, for gluing big assemblies out of styrene. Uh, CA can get brittle, uh, and you also have the problem that it can mar the surface. And when you're dealing with really huge pieces, it doesn't wick under all the way through like solvent cement does. Um, so it's, I think, preferable to use solvent if you if, if you can, you're not allergic to it or have a reaction to it. Um, so we can see on the bottom here around the, the door, the, the man door, how uh, that the fancy detail was built up. Um, here, that's just pieces of square and rectangular styrene that are piled up so that it, until it looks like the photo. And, it, you know, without the uh, influence of those old articles by uh, John Narich and Art Curran, I probably wouldn't have thought to do that. But that's, you know, basically how in reverse how the prototype did it by building up their uh, forms to cast the thing out of concrete. And then up here, uh, you can see this is a material called polyback. It's a resin impregnated craft paper material. And this was cut out on the laser. I thought about 
how could I reproduce this freeze detail that the prototype had without it becoming really labor intensive? And I uh, discussed it with a friend who had a laser cutter and he offered to cut it for me. Um, Cause all this is, is just a, a rectangle, a bunch of other little rectangles pasted into it on an Adobe Illustrator program. And then we could um, feed that into the laser cutter after it was scaled um, to match the dimension I had on the, the model. And then we spit out a bunch of strips on the laser cutter that could then be cut to length and fit in right here. That's very cool. Can you blow up the picture just a little bit so the sure building is more? Oh, here, here we go. you oh. can see the. Um, the oh pieces. yeah. So each one yeah, of these is just one piece, and it so just in a like a foot long strip that the laser cutter um, cut out. So again, the basic math of look at the prototype photo scale it down based on well how much space do i have how many of these little holes were there and so on is this an exact match for uh the dimension of the prototype probably not entirely the laser cut material is i said it's called polyback um it's it's literally like brown paper bag material that's been uh impregnated with resin and it this stuff is about a sixteenth of an inch thick um there's various uh, laser cut structure kits that use this for their windows and their uh, roof sheets and so on that don't have to have any detail on them. Um, I know like if you've had any of the flat cars from Exact Rail, it's what they use for their flat car decks. Um, so that type of thing. You'll, if you're familiar with building laser cut structure kits, you've probably used Polyback whether you're aware of it or not. Yeah, I think I added the, uh, the, the ends of my what do you call those uh, bulkhead flat cars that right. were from exact rail that had right. that material? And that's what yeah. that is. So like yeah. a critter, you mean like a cricket? Um, you could use something like a cricket for this. This is a more serious thing. It's, it's a, it's an actual uh, laser industrial laser cutting machine that my friend had access to um, that, that cut through this material. But you could probably, if you have access to something like a cricket, you could make some of these with a little thinner uh, relief to them and maybe stack them up. So, you know, it's whatever you have and whatever you want to be creative with. There's always 101 ways to, to do this. Stuff. Right. Yeah, there isn't a wrong way to do it as long as it comes out the way you want. I think that's a good comment. So here's what the building looked like with all that stuff now painted. Because remember, the prototype is pretty much just one color with the exception of the brick inserts and so on. And at this point, I've also glued in the windows. So I mentioned a while ago that these were Grantline eight pane wood windows. Um, so I had to cut all of the extra window muttons out with a knife carefully. So I didn't you know, break the one remaining one and then sanded the face of the window so that it was smooth. So it looked like metal. And then, you know, with that process done, I could paint those things in aluminum color and glue them into place. So um, those don't look like what they came out of the package as. But you can make, uh, you know, modern windows out of older ones because there's not that many modern window castings available. And the ones that I did find from, say, Pike stuff were the wrong size to really work on this structure. But the, the Grantline ones were the perfect size. So that's how they ended up getting used here. So it didn't really take that long to cut the extra pieces out and then sand these smooth. You can see there's a, a train life air conditioner. That's actually a polyback thing that it was uh, available in a kit that was the closest thing I could find to match the air conditioner on the prototype structure. I've now painted this uh, door assembly aluminum, got it glued in and so on. There's a little bit of tedious work going on there, but the results I think make it look, you know, it's worthwhile. Oh, sure. And there's no one step of this that's hard. It's just, you know, measure and cut a piece and, and use the solvent cement and attach it and then move on to the next piece. And if you have something like a Northwest short line chopper, you can make like all of these pieces at once, right? You can make all of the little horizontal pieces for this vertical area here all at one time on the chopper or all of these pieces are the same length. So they, they can all get fed through the chopper. So mm -hmm. the, the fabrication process doesn't necessarily take that long. And gluing them in is pretty easy, a little paintbrush and some MEK and it you know, gets everything stuck. But, you know, we've got something that's starting to look a lot more like a building, but it's not, 
you know, all the way done. Certainly, we just need to understand that at various stages of the process, it won't look like the prototype we're working from yet. But I needed to start building things like my uh, roof details. So this is the baghouse unit from the top of the main structure that we saw both from ground level and from the satellite view. And so I used the images that I had you know, found on my Google search and tried to compare them to what I had sitting in the scrap box. So I was, okay, I've got some Walther's piping units that have some fittings that maybe they're a little oversized from what the prototype had, but you know, they're what I had. And I didn't feel like scratch building every little tiny fitting on this thing because it's, it's not 100% reproduction anyway. So close enough. Um, so these are some pipes from Walther's piping kit. This is a Walther's blower unit from its blower and uh, ladder uh, detail set. One of the ladders and safety cages from that same set was utilized here. Um, I had some leftover railings from like a, a Helgen cement silo kit. So I cut those up and used them for this. There's some diamond tread walkway out of that same kit. Um, this is evergreen uh, standing seam metal roofing and some other evergreen styrene pieces. This little plenum here is some stacked up 60,000 styrene left over from the building walls. And then I filed that to shape and sanded it so it looked like this, um, this fitting here. These two little intakes are uh, detail parts from a Rick's concrete highway overpass. These are the parts that support the underside of the railings on, the, on that kit. They look just about the right size for um, the intakes on this bag house unit. So they, they fit perfectly here. And then some other pipes for the verticals. And then you can, don't really see it that well behind the wall, but the, the legs on this thing are some uh, H columns from Evergreen. And all the photos of the prototype showed that for some reason, this side of the support structure was plated over. So this is just like a piece of plain 20,000 styrene glued to the side of it to cover that up but if you look from the ends you can still see the rest of the supports under there and all this shape is visible from the satellite pictures yeah very cool I, I want to mention something and you didn't say this but I know that a lot of modelers will use what I refer to as the concept of diminishing returns you could make that piping smooth if you really wanted to but how much time do you want to spend on it right? exactly and that's that's the approach that I used on this is is anybody that knows the prototype going to know that that pipe union is not that big? Or is anybody going to care that this pipe shape is not 100% right? Because I didn't have piping that I could bend around that matched this exactly without going through a lot of extra work. And the rest of the building is what people are going to notice. And the fact that this is there is probably adequate. So and just make something that's more or less close enough to do its job and once it's painted and whether the viewer is not going to pick out that that's that piece of the building is not a hundred percent. Yeah. My, my guess is most of your operators will say, Oh, there's the flour mill. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah. Wait, 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 you built that. Where'd the Walters thing go? Uh, it was been gone for 10 years. Oh, Oh, oh well. <laughs> yeah. Sprues are great. I've got some sprues for piping that were used on here as well. I save sprues that uh, have good shapes for pipe because oftentimes they'll have good little bends and stuff in them. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea too, Sydney. Uh, going through stuff at train shows, if somebody's got leftover parts sitting around, um, I've gotten ladders and safety cages from parts bins. You know, they'll, somebody that's parting out somebody else's uh, shop, you know, from a state sale, they'll have a pile of stuff. Like, take this box for a buck. And, you know, maybe most of it you throw away, but you probably can get some good detail parts out of there if they've got something that uh, left over from kits that works for you. So, yeah, you can you can totally cheap out on a project like this and use that kind of thing. Yeah, I think that's another great modeling on a budget tip. You know, train shows are good for something. Yep. Photo etch parts, K&S engineering pipe detail. I had these other parts. And uh, I've used photo etched parts for other structures that are closer to the foreground. This is a background building that you're not going to be able to see that close. So for the, you know, the three foot viewing distance that this thing's going to be seen at, I didn't um, really think that adding the, the extra uh, photo etched parts would work on it, on it to make it worth you know, going to the effort of, do, of finding them when I didn't have them already. 
but they're great for uh, other buildings. And again, I've used those in ones that are closer to the foreground that you can see better. This thing is above viewer eye level for most people. Um, as high as the bench work is, I kind of have to crane my neck to look down and see all this stuff. So the fact that it's there is probably adequate, at least for my purposes. Of course, you know, I'm, a, I'm below average, so, you know, whatever. Um, this is how the, uh, the bag house unit looked once it's painted. It's not dull coated here yet. Um, here's the corrugated thing that sits on the roof over here. This is just some evergreen uh, corrugated metal siding. Uh, these horizontal vents in here, some other evergreen like freight car siding. Um, and here you can see I've added the brick inserts. I uh, cut these out and then painted them on mass and then glued them all in afterwards. And these are a little bit different texture than these other uh, brick inserts from the, the previous you know, patch outs in the building. So now we're getting closer to something that looks more like what the prototype does. I always wanted this to be a background building. This is, you can see the space here where there's a track at the bottom if, yeah, once the comment disappears from the screen. So this was a few inch deep scene at the back of this uh, layout. So this needed to be a background building. Uh, it was always intended to be a flat. So yeah, if I did not have photos of both sides, I, I could have still imagineered the other side. There actually are plenty of prototype photographs of the back side of this thing if I wanted to do both sides. Um, but this one only needed to be a uh, narrow structure. Uh, what's it about? It's a flour mill. I don't know if that answered it. That's oh, question. that was actually the guy's name. He was saying it looks fantastic. Oh, sorry. His, Thanks, His Phil. name is What's It About with Phil Craig, right? That would be a great question, though. Oops, that went <laughs> right over the top. Sorry. <laughs> So anyway, I've got this structure to the point where it's pretty well assembled. It's not weathered yet. I don't have all of the painting done, or the freeze detail. But now you I know, need to move on to this next one. I was going to say, even at that level of completion, it, it looks really great, you know? Yeah, it looks like so. something. You know, it's certainly better than having a blank space or a, an old uh, generic building at the back of your scene. Yeah. So here's the next building that goes over to the left. We can see it doesn't have all of the architectural detail of this main building, even though I think they were built at about the same time. Um, we can see the windows that I'm going to have to represent somehow, this loading shed, and I'm, I'm not representing this truck loader. There's another one of these bag house units over here. We can see a downspout scupper thing going on here from for drainage from the roof. So I've got to figure out how to build this thing and get all the pipes and so on together. So transferred the dimensions from this building over to this one because I could see that they were more or less the same. I didn't even have a diagram drawn up of this smaller building. I just knew what dimensions it had to be based on the drawing from the main one. And then once I uh, put it onto a piece of styrene and cut it out, I could see that, yes, it is going to work on that. So I didn't have to draw up any further. And if you remember the very first photo from the beginning of the presentation, it, it showed the arrangement of windows and doors here that's now invisible. So that historic photo let me build this stuff so that you can then see it through the loading shed. And again, if don't you know. don't have a photo, you can guess. Yeah, I, I don't know if this was part of your plan, but I like how that secondary building sort of goes up against that seam where the two backdrop walls come together. Kind yeah, of hides that was it. part of the plan. Because then from the, the normal viewer direction, from I'm taking this photo from the aisle more or less, it hides this corner. Mm-hmm. Do I keep the building in separate parts until I get it painted? Yes, um, because all these separate parts have different colors to them, and it's just easier to take something like the bag house and build it and finish it separately and then glue it to the structure at the very end. I think probably at this stage of construction, before it's weathered, they were just sitting here loose. So good question. So assembly of that thing progresses. Here's the other bag house unit to show how it was built a little closer view. We can see again some Walther's piping and some pipe unions, uh, leftover Walther's ladder. Um, and I forget what kit all of these little railings and stuff came out of. It was just boxes I had sitting around. Um, the evergreen standing seam roofing, um, extra little pieces of styrene for the separation between the clean air and dirty air parts of the bag house. 
since this is not that visible close up uh, for the door, I just used a plain piece of styrene. Uh, the prototype photos show that these doors don't have a whole lot of detail on them anyway. Um, I could tell from photos that this part of the unit had round legs on it with some finer um, bracing than the other bag house did. So I used some leftover Walther's pipe pieces for this. And you can see there's a little access door here. That's just a plain piece of styrene thrown onto the side of this. And then for, you know, bracing for the ladders, you know, plain piece of styrene from, you know, just having a, a box of different sizes of styrene that you can then pick from is great for this. Um, you know, it's just worth it to stock up on pieces of various sizes because then, you know, compare to a photo and figure out what's closest and go from there. So again, once that thing gets painted, you know, it looks like maybe a kit part that's supposed to be that way. You know, it doesn't show that it's just a whole bunch of different unrelated pieces attached together. We can see the downspout here. Um, this scupper is just a uh, piece of rectangular styrene that I filed down into the trapezoidal shape that the prototype had. It put a little thinner piece of styrene on the top to represent the cap on it. Uh, like 40,000 square styrene with some more 40,000 square brackets for the downspout because it uh, the prototype spaced it out in front of this um, horizontal ledge here that separates the different stories of the building. Over here on the right, the windows, I couldn't find the windows that are exact match. Um, I found that some grant line roundhouse windows, if I kit bashed them and glued them together were fairly close in size and then I could cut out um, a rectangular opening into them for these uh, vents that the prototype has not a hundred percent right for, for what the building is but close enough from viewing distance and my only other option was either uh, 3d print them or uh, have somebody laser cut them for me I'm like well these are these will do the job and you know one thing the prototype had is this story for some reason is a little taller than the other ones so this window has one bank of panes that was taller than the rest and so i rep uh, reproduced that so if you're familiar with the prototype uh and can see hey that, i know there's that extra tall story in here you could see that is reproduced here as well down along the bottom of this uh assembly there's a gap here in my uh parapet and that's where the um loading shed's going to go and this gives me a place to build it and clip it onto the building so this is just like a 60 thousandths thick wall that i can slide the uh, loading shed onto right so what we're seeing in this picture is the top of a rail car not a not the roof of another building right correct this is a yeah. like an air slide hopper right i just have it sitting here because that's the type of building that will or type of struck uh type of rail car that will be loaded at this structure and I wanted to get a good idea of what the proportions of the, the cars were as I was building this to make sure everything was fitting properly. Sure. It would suck to build it and find out it's too low, right? Yeah, that, that's a bummer when you do that. So um, the, the since the prototype has a new, another building in the way of this loading shed uh, anymore, I did find uh, on Bing Street View that there's something showing the edge of the shed and I can see it has, um, there's a truck loader on here that I did not have room to add. Um, so I left that off, but it shows me what the edge of the roof looks like. It shows me that there's these big fat rafter tails that come out the end. And it also shows that this thing is made in panels. There's two rafter tails and a seam, two more rafter tails and a seam. So whatever this is, is made out of uh, pieces that have looked like they've been lifted up into place. I don't know necessarily what they're made of, they may be metal because um, they have a pretty thin edge on either end here. Um, yeah. I, I could at the parking lot look and see that there's not much of an edge here. Is that photo good enough to enlarge it all? Yeah, you can enlarge it a bit. It gets pretty fuzzy, though. Oh, okay. There it is. Oh, yes. So you can see the rafter tails, and you can see the seam. And there you can see this other seam, and all the way down, you know, in between the rafters, you can see that there's vertical seams. So I can guesstimate you know, from known dimensions of other things on the building, how big these pieces have to be. Yeah. Looks like Blaine's asking about using styrene versus brass. Do I have a reason to prefer plastic details? 
on a project like this, I like being able to make it good and solid. And styrene glues really well to other styrene. Um, so for anything that's like a big heavy duty assembly that it, 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 it's big enough, that it might have enough weight to where you grab it wrong and it can snap if it's made out of flimsier materials. I like using styrene for that because the joints are so strong. Uh, for foreground material, I'll bite the bullet and use something that's finer like uh, uh, metal etchings or brass parts. Or if I need something that's small brass wire, I'll use it. But I like working with styrene because it's so easy to glue with, uh, with solvents and it stays good and strong. Dissimilar materials automatically start making things a little bit weaker. Um, so that that's another reason. I think you'd have to use CA glue for that too, wouldn't you? You would. And for certain types of assembly, CA is really good. Um, for other things like end for end assemblies or like gluing little pieces of wire on CA is, is fairly weak, but I do use it. There's wire and stuff that's on, that's on here, actually on this building, you'll see it in a little bit. Um, so here's the scaled down loading shed. I built this as a separate, um, assembly and it remains separate. I never glued it onto the building. Um, there's there's holes in the structure here where the pipes go through and in the roof. And this thing, as I mentioned, it clips onto this top of the wall. So on the back side of here where you can't see it, uh, there's additional styrene that goes down to the level of the roof and there's a space left in between that's the thickness of this, uh, this parapet on this wall. So the whole thing just snaps together. Did you glue it in place or do you just set it in there? It's just set in place and it doesn't move because of how it's designed with the plastic clip. It just mm -hmm. snaps on. Do you ever have a reason to remove it or? Yeah. Cause if I'm, if I need to pull this out, you can see the scene's not done yet. And so I'll need to do ground cover. I'll need to paint and ballast the track. Uh, so if I need to pick all this off, it helps to not have something that's all in one, one big assembly to where it's going to be flopping around and maybe break. If I can pull it off in sub assemblies, it makes it more survivable. I figured that was the case, but I thought someone might have that question. Sure. And uh, one thing to look at on here, if we can blow this up, you can see the texture on the, the roof here. This is a uh, gift tissue from the craft store type of thing that you would stuff inside of a gift bag. Um, this is available in gray and black and various other colors. And I cut this into strips and glued it onto this roof with a 3M Super 77 spray adhesive. And that gives me a texture of tar paper. Um, and then once, once this is weathered, um, you can see the edges. So having something that's not perfectly smooth up here to represent the tar paper that was on the prototype um, gives a little bit different look than the tar and gravel roof that's everywhere else on this thing. And you can see under the edge here, the, the big rafter tails that are visible in the prototype photos. Um, mm -hmm. Plastic angle glued on the edge makes something that looks like a gutter. And then this downspout is square styrene and then a little uh, gutter piece that was cut out of a microengineering kit for an unrelated building that had a too small um, you know, gutter assembly on it. So I just combined it with some other pieces to make a bigger one for this. But we could almost call this video odds and ends. Yeah, it pretty much is. You can see more more Walther's pipe here. Just stuff. And there's um, some roofs that are on the side of the uh, of this lower portion of the building here that are attached with uh, wire. Can't remember if one of the other photographs will show those. But um, the prototype photo showed that there's uh, metal rods supporting these little roofs that hang off the side that are made out of corrugated styrene. And so those needed to be wire. So I drilled some holes and added some wire supports for those. And there's some wire supports for some other things as well, the things that needed to be finer. So from prior photos, this wasn't weathered and all these little spaces weren't painted. So I, I decided to go through here and paint all of these little gaps in the freeze detail, because that's a prominent thing that the prototype has. Started to add chalk dust and wash weathering uh, on the back sides of these windows. These are more of the Grant Line roundhouse windows. You know, the prototype has a budget for the product project like this. 
I'm not sure what the budget for this project was because I didn't spend a lot on it because it was made out of stuff I had sitting around. Um, you could probably build a major structure like this for about the cost of what you would get from a, a Walther's plastic kit. Um, certainly for for less. Are these large sheets available in the Salt Lake City area? Yes, there's a plastic suppliers in Salt Lake and Ogden area and any major metro you're going to find them. Just look in the look in your white page website under plastics and then call and make sure that they will sell to you uh, retail. Some of them like to do wholesale only, but most of them, if you know what you want and you can just pay for it on online and run and pick it up, they're happy to sell you a sheet. Yeah, leftover laser kit parts, Doug's comment, that's great too. Yeah, I, I, I have used leftover laser kit parts on things like this. So, I but think I've, I, think, I don't know. I think I've heard of that guy. Yeah, that Doug guy. Yeah, he's a good yeah. guy. That's what I heard. Yep. Uh, so on the back side of the window glass um, here to represent some of the discoloration and replace glass panes, this is some acrylic craft paint painted on the back of the panes. Um, again, since this is a background structure, I didn't feel that I needed to do individual pieces of corrugated material here. So some uh, uh, fine uh, pencil was used to draw in the separate pieces of corrugated uh, siding here. And, and some uh, uh, watercolor pencils of different colors were utilized to discolor, you know, different pieces of siding so that they would, you know, not look like they were all the same shade because these things, you know, change color over the years as they weather. And then we can see some washes that were washed into these vents. And then some chalk dust that started to build up on the rest of the wall. Ah, I want to do that. Um, we can see some vents that I added here. These are from Blair Line, some of their laser cut uh, wood vent material that looked very close to what the prototype vents were with some uh, chalk dust weathering on them. You know, here I don't have the glass in behind, uh, behind these metal windows yet. This is what it looks like with the glass added. If uh, you recall from the beginning, I discussed that there was some screen on one side of these metal units where uh, you could see different color on either side. So to represent the uh, screen effect, you can either hit it with some uh, uh, flat finish, or I tried that and that didn't really give us the enti uh, entire look I was looking for. So I used some very fine sandpaper and then just sandpapered the back of these. You know, on the prototype, since there's flower dust inside the building and grain dust, I think the, um, the windows get that stuff sticking to the screens which makes the screen show up rather prominently. So the, the sanding of the backside of one half of each one of these gives the look of that, that dirt that collects on the screens. Uh, you can see some weathering here on the air conditioner from some chalk dust, um, some washes that went into the brick here to show the brick um, detail. Represent like there's mortar scenes. Over the year. Yeah, so there's mortar and so on that has been filled up. These are all painted over. And then there's mortar from the, this uh, this brick. So, you know, just keep adding uh, based on the prototype photos. One of the things I noticed, is, and you can see it a little more if I blow this up, is that underneath the corners of all these metal windows, there are streaks on the prototype from where the, the metal is oxidizing and the oxide is running down the paint on the face of the building. And this is just drawn on with some watercolor pencils, some uh, light grayish color to simulate that because every one of these windows I saw in the prototype had this streak at the corner where the water runs down and carries the uh, oxidized aluminum down. This little vent here is a piece of uh, the vent from the Walther's uh, blower duct. The blower that I used on the roof for the, um, uh, the bag house unit had this square ducting, so I just cut a piece of that off at an angle and used that for this vent. Um, the steps here are built up from uh, 60 thousandths and 80 thousandths uh, styrene just uh, piled on top of each other and the edges sanded smooth. This railing is from a uh, Pike Stuff metal warehouse kit. I realized that was very close to the railing that was on the prototype, so I used that here. Um, there's another railing here in the middle of these uh, these buildings. Oh, you can and see the roof there too. Yeah, and here's yeah. the roofs with the wire 
uh, supports on them. I don't remember what kit this came out. I think this was a Great West Models um, kit. These steps were scratch built the same way, just stacked up styrene that's sanded smooth. But all you know, all the little odds and ends that went into the building. You here, you can see them. You know, it's kind of piled up. And if so you I didn't know this was odds and ends, you know, you might think that oh, this is you know something that's a really complex design, and because of all the prototype shapes that are represented, but it's just stacks of stuff glued together with MEK. Yeah, I think stacking the styrene like that is a great tip, also because people would look at a staircase, a real staircase, and go. Oh, that's a big pain in the butt to make that. Oh, and these no. guys have to be super skilled. You can just stack styrene and it looks like a staircase. It doesn't have to be built the same way as the real thing, right? No, no. So if a typical step in uh, scale might be eight inches. And that's really close to 80,000 styrene. Mm -hmm. um, so stack that stuff up and you've got a stairway. And then just you know make sure that you sand and file the edges. I use emery boards. What do I use for window glass? Uh, the window glass on this one is all um, plain uh, acetate from some building kits that I had saved. Uh, I think it was from a city classics building that had some fairly heavy acetate that looked like it was going to work. So uh, that's what was used here. Thanks, Blaine. And I think this is our last photo. Oh, is it? I guess that means we can take other questions if people have them. That came in right at an hour, just like we thought, John. Oh, look at that. One hour and one minute. So if I hadn't talked so much at the beginning, we would have been right on time. Now nah, we're right on time. We're good. <laughs> yeah. We didn't really know how long this was going to take since this is the first uh, show of its kind on the channel. So why don't we make the, the building go away? Or actually, you know what? Let's leave the building on just in case there's questions that you need to zoom in or bring back the pictures. Uh, we don't need to make ourselves big unless you really want to. Okay. But I've kind of been writing little notes down as we're talking or as you're talking and as sort of takeaways that I have from this whole experience here. Oh, here's a question from Joey. Why don't you take that first? How long did this project take to complete? Um, working not 100% of the time on it, um, it took me about six weeks. I started at sort of the end of March. Uh, last year, and I was done sometime in May. Mm -hmm. But that's not working on it uh, constantly. And and because this was something that it, it had no kit, and I was developing it all from scratch, it took quite a bit of time to look at, uh, you know, the prototype photos and do my drawings and mess around with stuff and do mock ups and that type of thing. So, you know, I spent a week or so messing around with that before I really started to build it. That kind of leads me to a question, Rob, which is, so like for, I imagine myself trying to do something like this. And first of all, I don't have all the parts and odds and ends, but how are you organized your odds and ends? Because if it were me, I'd just throw a bunch of crap in a drawer and hope I could I find it. I got a lot later. of crap in a box. Is it and all I, in with the same place? No, I've, I've got, like, if I save a kit, I typically will save um, the box that that kit came in. And I'll just throw the leftover parts in that box. So uh, later on, I'll think, okay, I need a part from a, uh, a Walther's kit of some kind. And I remember what, oh, that's part of interstate fuels. So I'll go look in the interstate fuels box. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of remember what you had and the kits you did build, I guess. Right. But um, and I rarely build a kit with all the parts that come in it. I'll look at a kit as a pile of stuff that I can use to make something else. So I, I almost always have leftover pieces in there. Um, so I will just leave those pieces and try to remember, or you can catalog them. You know, if you, mm -hmm. if you have some like a database or just a, a, a text document or something, you can, you know, document, you know, like I want to remember that there's a blower unit in this kit. And so you'll say, and so if you then do a search of your text document, you can say, okay, blower. Okay, that's out of this Walther's thing. I'll go dig that out. Or, oh, this this one was from uh, a Bar Mills kit. I remember I had leftover stuff from my, I built something from Bar Mills. So I'll go in that kit. 
um, or I know that Pike stuff has this stuff. So like I've got when I finish all my like Pike stuff metal buildings, I throw all that together. So I've got this like big gallon storage bag, Ziploc bag full of Pike stuff parts, or I have a big Ziploc bag full of uh, some other modular kit parts from Design Preservation, or I have another bag full of Great West parts. Right. The point, though, is to save your junk. That was one of the takeaways that I have, because I could see someone building a kit, and then when they're done, they just throw everything away. Oh, don't so do that. Right? You're throwing away stuff you can probably use yeah, that's in cool. the future. Don't throw that stuff out. <laughs> it's not really waste, I guess, huh? Do I have any three? Not on this part. I've got, there's some 3D printed things I've used on other, other kits. Uh, I especially like the parts from uh, dimensional modeling concepts. They have a lot of great details in 3D um, that I've used on other structures, but uh, this one didn't have any 3D printed parts. Hey, it might be an excuse to do another one of these sometime. Got to show the building with the 3D pr printed stuff. Yeah, I, I had a, uh, a kit that I turned into a diner. It was intended to be like a grocery store, but I, I wanted to make a diner out of it. And uh, Dimensional Modeling Concepts had some grease fans for the roof, and so I've got some fans on there. So it, it has more of a diner vibe than a supermarket vibe. Right. Very cool. One of the other takeaways that I wrote down as I was listening to you talk is being able to use co or co you know readily available fo fo photos from map sites i think is a smart idea and not being confused about dimensions simply by looking at something that you know the dimension of and extrapolating from there i think that's a right great and, and one of the, the one of the things that helps you on that if you have other buildings on the railroad that you've built from other kits you can guess the dimension of something that you want to scratch build by looking at that that other things like how far are the floors apart about how big is a door mm -hmm. um, and that type of stuff. Do we have a photo of the layout so we can see where that building lives? Hmm. Um, John, had, if you want to take that, take my screen down, John, I can go, sure. I'll go find one. Okay. Uh, question, Sidden. You mean this one? Oh, yeah. There you go. That way I don't uh, bore everybody while I'm looking for my pictures because I believe I have some relatively current pictures of that scene because I'm working on some other parts of it. People might find out you're a cat guy. Yeah, well, if you can hear the cat meowing in the background, you can, you know, there's a feline <laughs> Maybe, agent here. Right. Maybe while you're looking for that, I want to mention another takeaway that I wrote down on my little notes here, which is laminating even thin styrene really makes the seams visible. And I think that's a nice little trick as well. Yeah. You know, building stuff up out of nothing, you know, it's, it's amazing what you start to get. Let me see if this photo is the one I want to use here. There's another uh, interesting question, a couple of questions that people are asking, which we can get to in a minute once you find your photograph. Yeah, here, if okay. you want to, th this scene's not done, but um, if you want to share back. I'd uh, like to, but for some reason, yeah, I let's see if it, let's see if it doesn't. Once I change the photo, it doesn't like to do it. Let me try to share it again. As soon as I changed from the folder it was looking at, it decided it wasn't happy with me. Yeah, to me, it's telling me that the device is not connected. Here we go. There we go. There we go. Oh, so yeah. There's, there's an unfinished scene. Here's the old Walters elevator that I just temporarily shoved over to the side. Um, here's the flour mill in the back. Um, this fuel dealer that's in progress here in the front, this is closer to the viewer, and it has some etched metal parts, like some see-through walkways and so on in it. Is um, this that little town sec segment that's kind of in that back corner? Yeah. This is a, this is just a peninsula that has a bunch of industries on it that you can get around from all sides. So it's not really a huge, deep scene with a hard reach. It's just a place that you can walk around and see from every direction. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's various structures in here that utilize the same general concept as that flour mill to create them, like this fuel dealer, a bunch of parts from several different kits, from Walther's, an old um, Alexander or Williams Brothers kit for some of these pipes, um, piping kit pieces, uh, railings from Central Valley, um, 
other Central Valley railings visible on this other structure in the foreground, sidewalks from Walters, parking lots made out of styrene sheet, um, design preservation pieces or some you know wire details and stuff on some of these closer buildings that are finer. But you see there's there's a reason why that flour mill didn't have a lot of really fine detail on it because it's just way back here. You can yeah, see you it know, closer from another viewing angle, but that's typical. Yeah, if, I, if I remember right, there was a little walkway just around the corner to the right there where you could get in there to service the industry, right? Right, With yeah. Th there's a there's an easily reachable aisleway over here where you can get you know much closer to that structure. I remember liking that little city scene a lot. I re seem to recall there were some parking spaces, and they even had those little bumpers that you have in a, a parking lot. That was really cool. Yeah, those are from, um, you can get those. I think Walters has those, and BLMA had them. Did I take a trip to this factory location? Yes. Um, it's actually on my way to work. So I was able to drive by it. Did you have any flashbacks of going to work? Making the model? <laughs> no, no. Tried, tried to, tried hard to avoid that. I, I don't hate my work, so that's okay. That if I can take this away. I can, I can get uh, uh, another couple of photos from this city that, where you can see some of the things that we've been talking about here. Sure. Why don't we uh, do that? And you can fish. Uh, in the meantime, Joey had a question. If thought I saw it a second ago, would you ever consider using photographs as details on a structure? Yes, oh, I've I done see. so. Yeah, I see what he what he's saying. Yeah. yeah, I think some people use photos as interiors for for places too, don't they? They do. Um, photos for interiors are great. This next this next structure I'm going to show you does have some photos used on it. So let me share this one with you. Since people have asked, these are helping to answer some questions. So sure. Yeah, I think that's good. Uh, it gives people, I think, a better clue about what your layout is like too so right oh, so yeah, this, this is the diner um yeah, there's some photographs here the curtains here are photos um, i think i took these from the ikea website from some drapes um there's a photo yeah can i blow that up sure yeah it's just a little bit it's hard to tell at least on my screen it's hard to tell oh i see yeah it was hard I to see. tell that here's, here's the photos of the drapes um, I took a photo of an open sign and scaled it down and printed that off for the open sign for the front window. Um, there is uh, some photos online of the diner sign from the uh, Double R Diner from Twin Peaks that had kind of a neat look to it. So I um, scaled those and used those for the Double L Diner sign here, named for my uh, daughters, Lainey and Lizzie. This is another detail that was cut out on a laser cutter. Mm -hmm. So that you can see when this is blown up, you can see that this is stacked up pieces of laser cut material. Uh, but this is just laminations of laser cut material and some photos. And here's the 3D printed um, grease fans for the ceiling. Um, some wire supports for the roof, wire door handles. I uh, many years ago picked up some of these chooch Coca-Cola button signs. I found those, forgot that I had them in my pile of stuff to use for uh, commercial buildings. I found these, used those. So, you know, just a lot of crap from the scrap box that, uh, you know, once I go to build a building, I can find it. And it's like, hey, I found this weekly special sign and leftover paper parts from a, a building that I wasn't using. Someone's mentioning how good the doors look, and they do. Those separately yeah, applied little wires, huh? Yeah, those separately applied little wires do a lot because this is just a door that's cast on to the, this is a city classics building. Mm -hmm. And it has this tile front um, look to it. And there's a lot of prototype buildings in, in my area that had these tile fronts on them. Um, so I, and most of them seem to be black. So I just painted this black and, uh, this is actual tile grout that was rubbed into here to put the <laughs> grout lines into it. And there's usually little cracks and busted up places in the corners. Cause they've been all these buildings with date from like the thirties, 1930s. So they're usually, um, have a bunch of little worn areas here. So if the tile grout doesn't, you know, fit in everywhere and look perfect, it looks just like the prototype. Cause they're all, you know, kind of getting worn over time. 
I'm Let's also go. liking the the roof there, Rob. That has the the looks like a tar. You know yeah, the that tar over. Seat. Yeah, the little overhang. I, I like how that's painted in a way that it looks like someone was up there with a big mop, just mm -hmm. putting that crap on. Yeah, and the flashing here is just a piece of typing paper that's spray painted with silver paint. <laughs> that's great. One one of the reasons why I wanted to show this little building here is that this is a small structure, a small project. The, the brick building was a DPM module kit, correct? Uh, but you could make uh, you know a signature scene out of something like this. This isn't a prototype building, but again, I used pictures from the internet to figure out what um, the signs should look like, how to arrange the details on this, and how to cook up something out of just a, a, a simple structure. And here's those car stops, John. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. It's not a prototype building, but it looks like one. I mean, it's very plausible. I, I would expect to drive into some small town somewhere and see this thing. And the tile on the front, the tile on the front is cast onto the wall. This is a one piece wall casting from city classics. And that tile is just on there. Um, this, I think it's called their city market. I think the picture on their website, the tile is red, but um, mm -hmm. do I add LEDs? Someday I might, I hate wiring stuff. So I get to the point where I've got the building finished to this point and I'm just done with it. And I might add LEDs later when I feel like it, which so far has been not. Is the industry area layout also prototypical? Yes, to the greatest extent I can from photos, just to make it plausible. So um, this industry scene is based on like a, a couple of streets in Salt Lake City um, that have similar industries to what I'm modeling. So like this, uh, there's a ditch down here next to this steel fabricator. It's kind of fuzzy in the background here, but you know, the ditches, the drain pipes, the little um, warning signs, the, you know, the crud that's piled up in the ditch, the fences that are set back from the street, you know, the billboards that are set off here. These are all from photos of the prototype industry area so that the whole scene pulls together and looks right. I think that's another great tip, using photographs of actual places to provide plausibility for your scenes is great right we've all been in a cafe that looks like this you know and if it, and if it was back in the day you, you, you can smell a cigarette smoke from when you walk in the door and the smoking area pretty much is a whole building evergreen does make tile sheeting that's correct yeah and it, it looks great you can add it to stuff like this absolutely that evergreen stuff works just as well and you can tile grout over the top of it and it you know, pretty much looks like this thanks doug yeah this was one of my favorite little buildings that i did uh, my preferred method for making uh, roads and parking lots is tile grout. All of the uh, roads in the scenes that you've seen here, this is uh, sanded grout. Hmm. And you can paint it. Um, you can weather it with, you can see the, the oil piled up in the parking spaces here. And that's just from uh, chalk dust. And uh, you can draw on the uh, cracks in the road using a fine paintbrush or I, I try to develop a crack pattern like with a pencil and then I'll paint brush them on for tar patches. Um, you can draw on uh, things like the uh, lane markings and parking lot markings with a uh, watercolor pencil. That's a great tip. Just use a ruler or some kind of straight edge and draw it on there. Right, because it, it, it's easier to do that than to try to get paint to come out exactly right. And when yeah, I do paint I, any of this, I use washes rather than just straight paint. Right. I've seen people do roads and sidewalks where I think they're using decals or something where they put the lines on. And it's like, I've never seen a road like that. Those lines are always messed up somewhere or missing spots or there's a skid mark over, you know, where someone peeled out on it or something. Right, so. right. That, 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 and, and, you know, drawing it on is, is the great way to do that. And this sidewalk yeah. is just sidewalk parts from Walters. Is it just odds and ends or? Yeah, do just they have there, there from their concrete street kit. And that's like where the storm drain came from is out of the Walters kit. And then I would, yeah. you know, put some cracks in here, like with a, a, a knife or something. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, these are nice these are pretty easy to to mess around with and turn into urban sidewalks. And um either some plain styrene because they don't have a gutter that's part of theirs that's integral to their thing i either cut the gutter out of the concrete street 
because I'm not using their street because it's too narrow. You know, Utah streets tend to be really wide. Mm -hmm. um, so I either use styrene or cut the gutter off of the edge of the, the Walther Street and glued it on here. Then that becomes the screed for um, putting the grout on here. So I can use like my metal straight edge uh, drywall knife or whatever as I'm moving the grout around and screed it off against this gutter that's just styrene. Yeah, lots of good ideas. Well, that's what this was supposed to be. Good ideas. Yeah, as long as people still have questions and I got photos to answer them, I'm glad to stick around for a bit if people, you know, want some ideas. Yeah, throw your questions up, guys. This is, uh, it's great. I, I mean, I don't have any intention right now of building this kind of stuff, but I could certainly go back and watch this and get all kinds of inspiration from it. So thanks for sharing. Oh, hey, you're welcome. Because, you know, it's just passing it forward. I got all that inspiration from those other modelers and the magazines and such. And it feels great to be able to share that with people and maybe, you know, give somebody a spark to create a project for their layout, and make something that's not like what comes out of the box. Yeah, that's awesome. That's kind of what I'm trying to do here. I'm glad you get it. <laughs> a picture of the layout room. Um, I've got some pictures. Yes, Sydney, I can get uh, that for you. Should we make that go away? Oh, yeah. There it goes. Oh, you made it go away. I made it go away. Hey, Look at this. We're figuring like an, this out a little more all the time, huh? Yeah, it's like an expert now. What do you need me for? I can just shut up and go away. Okay. It would be a better program. <laughs> I don't know about that. Let's see. Here we go. Um, some. I don't have one that's just the room, but I do have some photos that kind of show what the overall look of the room is here's one we can try yeah while you're bringing that up someone's wondering if you've built an engine house i have it's not um not finished i've got it in this presentation here that i can i can find it really quick someone else is wondering if you're a master model railroad or certified by the nmra no do you have I'm any intentions? but not that kind of certified <laughs> do you have any intentions of going for the master or no not really. I mean, I, yeah. if I want to do that later, maybe, but mostly it's just like, if I'm satisfied with what I'm doing, I don't care that I have a certificate that says something about it. You know, I'm just doing yeah. it for me, not to impress anybody. This is what the overall look of the room is. Um, see the, everything's finished. There's recessed lighting. Uh, it's all drywalled and insulated. So it's a nice place to be in the winter. Um, Around the outside edge of the railroad, there's uh, curtains to hide the storage. Uh, you know, the fascia is all um, completed and smooth with uh, hidden fasteners so it uh, doesn't distract from uh, the look. So this is what everything looks like everywhere you go in the train room is this basic sort of appearance. I want to say something that because I remember this from when I was there in 2019. It was before you had the curtains. Right. Yeah. yeah. When you guys came, I didn't have these uh, installed right. yet. I did them actually just a couple of months after the uh, the convention. So I wish I'd had them up for the convention, but I, I, I just didn't have everything ready to throw them up there. But yeah, when the convention visitors were here, all this was visible and you could see the storage underneath. Hopefully it wasn't too gross and messy, but it looks nicer no, now. No, that, that's what I was going to say. I, I remember when I was there and it might be that you just cleaned it up because of the convention, because that's a pretty yeah, important did. convention, right? The national. Yeah, I didn't I remember. I, awful, but yeah. I, I ducked down and I looked and I could see all the way across to the other side of the room. And I was thinking, wow, there's not piles and piles and piles. Of no, the piles, there, there. there's no piles except for stuff that I'm working on. I actually, right. um, because th these buildings are big. I, I work on them a lot on the floor. Mm -hmm. um, so I figure so, if I if I can get down on the floor to work with woodworking or do cut sheet rock or something like that, I might as well use the big four by eight sheets of styrene down there. It's way easier to work on those on the floor than on a workbench. Yeah. And you need that space, especially if you're cutting out those styrene sheets, like you said. Uh, something else that I'd mention that I think is important as a guy who does videos is your lighting is very even. And it's all in that nice 5,000 range, 5,000 Kelvin range that I like, as I recall. Yeah, I think that's what it is. It's all 5,000. Let me see if I can find a picture of the engine house. Um, oh, don't have one totally handy here. It's that that scene isn't done. There, it's a, it's a Pike stuff car shop that's waiting for additional, um, you know, work so that it's presentable. 
Yeah, and I know in that slideshow that I had, there was an engine servicing facility or a fueling there was. facility. That was, that was it. Oh, should I run that again real yeah, quick? Yeah, if you want to run that again, the, the engine facility and the, the unfinished engine house is in that. Sure, I think I can bring that up here. This is the... Uh, and you've got some go. other, other pictures of the, the city as well. Oh, there's a picture of the city. Yep. Um, I don't know if I can pause this. I don't think That's I can. Okay. We'll, we'll just tell people when it gets there. That's the opposite side of the building is behind the diner we were just looking at. Yeah, these were photos that I took when I was there. Yeah, but, you know, every one of these buildings is pretty much the same idea as the ones we've been talking about. You know, piles of stuff. That one's kind of similar to the one we looked at. Hey, yeah, I, I thought I, I had... I thought the engine house was in there. Maybe not. I, I thought it was, too. I know it was in the collection of photos that I had. Let me see if I can... Uh, maybe I can bring that up on a share screen or something, because I know I have it on the computer here. Why don't you take whatever questions come in, and I'm going to yeah, look sure. for it real quick. A more in-depth video of backdrop painting than I did on Toy Man TV. I don't. Um, I actually recommend going through um, some of the internet how-to channels um, that show where guys are showing how to paint. Um, there's a guy I follow. Um, his name is Michael James Smith. He's uh, I think he's English. He has um, some photorealistic backdrop painting ideas, or not? That he doesn't do backdrops. It's just painting ideas for oil paints, and you could use them for acrylics. Um, but there's a number of guys on YouTube that has some really nice videos showing how to paint, and I'd recommend those because those are they're they're ideas that aren't specific to model railroading. So there is a ton of great information out there on how to paint and uh, and develop things like this. I'm not able to find the find that photo. Okay, it, I'm just kind of scrolling around, seeing if I can find one while you're while you're looking here. Yeah, it's on the other computer that the top secret producer is on right now. Otherwise, I would have brought it up. I, I thought I had it on this little portable drive that I brought over here, but it's not here. Yeah, it's no, it, sorry it's about that. Most, no, that's okay. It's not the most exciting structure, and it, it, it's one that I may end up replacing anyway. So, um, you know, it just could be one of those projects that, like this this one we've just been doing, where at some point it just gets uh, gets taken out and turned into something better. Any water on the layout and bridges? Yes, there are a number of different um, scenes on the layout that have have some water in them, and. See if I can quickly scroll into one of those because I just not that long ago redid a, a scene that has some water. One of the things I remember also about the layout while you're looking, I'll mention it, is that your use of space, you have some areas that are just long stretches of empty railroad, which really adds to the realism when you consider what it is you're trying to model there on the area west of salt lake city yeah i like empty so there's a lot of empty space here oh i know where my um water scene stuff is yeah it seems like it would be a challenge to make open spaces like that plausible or you know interesting to look at but you did a good job with that because i never thought when I was looking at it, oh, this is kind of boring. It's a long open space, you know. Oh, here we go. Yeah, there's one oh. of the water scenes on the railroad. This is um, epoxy resin with some uh, Mod Podge gloss on the surface of it to represent the waves. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Rob. When Eventually, when we're able to travel safely again, I want to come back over there and do a, a full layout tour in 4K for the viewers because... It's one of the better layouts I think I've ever seen. Well, I appreciate that, John. Um, so yeah, yeah thank you. You're, you're welcome to come back and take some video when it's safe to do that for sure. Yeah. Create a lot of unique brick structures you can't find with kits. One of the things yeah. I like to do uh, is, is go through, you know, the catalogs and find, you know, what manufacturers have things that maybe aren't directly usable, but that I can, maybe hack stuff out of 
uh, something that may not be intended as a modular kit, but that has useful parts. Um, there's some brick sheet that's available. I think Monster Model Works is back doing brick sheet again, or will be soon. And their their brick stuff is made out of wood. You can use that to do some really nice brick walls. Walther's sells brick sheet. Um, there's different types of you know concrete block sheet you can get from you know Pike stuff or Evergreen. Um, so sometimes it's it's good to just get raw materials and others just okay there's a building that has some sort of a wall that's kind of usable maybe grab that kit without the intent of building it as such but the intent of hacking it up and turning it into walls that are useful on something else because you can do all kinds of stuff with uh, the blank walls from like the design preservation modular buildings you can cut your own windows in there you can laminate stuff on them you can change brick to concrete um, imagine that laser art has some great stuff. Uh, GC laser has some usable modular components. Um, and the, you know, if you, if you find some of those modular systems, you might find inspiration there to, uh, just pick and choose which parts that you can use to hack into something. Yeah. Someone's asking about the, the types of, uh, light, the type of lighting that you use and it's a recessed led, isn't it? It's, it's recessed lights that are just regular can lights. And I've, I initially had uh, compact fluorescence in them, um, but I've since uh, gone to uh, LEDs that are a little bit more even and a bit brighter. Um, so probably those, a better color temperature too, right? They were, they're very similar. Um, they were, cause the, I, I was using daylight fluorescence in there. And so when I switched okay. over to LEDs, the color stayed pretty much the same. Very good. Somebody asked about the cold, the cold storage and so on facilities. Uh, glad you like those. Those are very simple. One of them is another just piece of styrene with some stuff thrown on it uh, for some seams. And the other one was uh, modular punch chunks from a, a Great West kit. Yeah, lots of compliments. Got the office great. Thank you. And I can tell you that all these compliments are deserved having seen it in person. Uh, anybody that hasn't seen the layout in person, if whenever they have another convention in Salt Lake, it might be a while, but I yeah. would assume you'd be open for something like that. It's very much worthwhile to, to sure. get it. I, I, may, I don't update it much right now because I'm just doing freight cars and things that, that don't really fit into it. But I have a blog at Model Railroad Hobbyist. If you go to MRH's website, I mean, you search for my name, you can find the blog. So uh, photos of nearly all these scenes are available on there and you can ask me questions on there. I'll be glad to answer. N scale architect really has nice sheet. That's true. Another good manufacturer. And I think they make it in HO, even though they're called N scale architect, they have some that's big enough to use an HO. Well, so one of the, one of the complaints I've heard about the HO brick sheets is that they tend to be oversized bricks. Some of them are. Um, some of the old stuff from Holgate and Reynolds that was intended actually for like TT scale uh, it, or that's scaled smaller than HO anyway, works great because it's um, it's a little undersized for what we're used to seeing, but it uh, it doesn't have that big in your face, too big brick look to it. Right. Yeah, excellent. Are there hobby shops? I don't know that Douglas is still around in our area. Um, train Life is here, and there's another uh, train uh, shop in Salt Lake is still here. And I both uh, use both of those. I try to do local business wherever I can before I go on the Internet, so I'll order through the local shop. But, yeah, I have those two local shops that I support. Yeah, one great draw to the – oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Rob. I didn't mean to cut you off. That's fine. I was going to say one great draw to train life is that they also have Pelly Soeborg's Daneberg sub layout in their shop there. That's also worth looking at if you have right. a chance, if you're and, in the and, area. And Pele's articles that are collected into that uh, book that uh, MR put out, uh, they have that book in there as well. So you can, uh, you know, look at it for inspiration and buy the book and see how he does Cause he does a lot of this too. He's another great inspiration for all of us using just various stuff, throw it together to make a model. You know, it's funny, I, I did an interview with him a while back here on the channel. And as I was talking to him, I, I thought, oh, I'm going to ask a really good question and get like the secret to great modeling, you know, some some revelation. 
So I asked him, so, you know, you're, you don't even live in the U S how do you make it look so, so plausible, so accurate. And his answer was the simplest, but very profound answer. He says, I model what I see. I, I thought it was going to be something, you know, some little secret that everybody would model <laughs> what you see is the answer to everything. I guess it is right. I mean, <laughs> I mean that, that, how, how do I make my scene look plausible? Well, model it from a photo. And yeah. you can you can take photos of things that you're not intending to model yourself. Like if you take a photo of an industrial area that's just generic, you know, your structures don't have to be what's in there, but you can see sidewalks. What does the pavement look like? Arrangements of dumpsters, fences, junk up on the sides of buildings. Translate that to your scene. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the scene may not be of anything that you're modeling specifically, but it's full of things that you can look at and translate to your, your own work. Yeah, that's a great, great tip. And I've heard that from other people who are also very good modelers. They, they say, well, even if you're doing something that's not a prototype, like you're not, it's not the yard at XYZ place, but you can still take a picture from XYZ place and put some of that stuff, little piles of junk or stuff that's in a train yard, you know, the, the wheel sets stacked up, you know, on a track someplace. All that right. stuff. I've got, I got a couple of photos I can share for stuff like that that uh, you know could you know help illustrate that for us. Sure. Uh, as soon as I see the thing, I'll yeah, pop those I'm, up. I'm working on it. Just takes a bunch of clicks to do the screen share on this thing. Okay, I see it popping up. Oh yeah, here we go. So this is from uh, the west side of Salt Lake City, you know, the old DNRGW Roper Yard. Uh, so this is a, an industry spur. So we can see here the arrangement of the chain link fences. You can see there's a big pile of gravel here to serve as a bumper at the end of the track. Um, you can see hoses and pipes running along the edge of the track here. And you can see where the, the fence is biffed out, where they fish the hose under here to hook to the tank cars. On this structure next door, there's an air conditioning unit hanging off the wall. There's a vent hanging out of the wall there. Pallets. Uh, there's a pile of pallets. So it's like, okay, a uh, bunch of... Uh, laser cut wood or styrene pallets in a pile makes for a good detail. Yep. And we can see the difference between there's paved uh, access to the back of this building combined with dirt. And then how do the, the weeds and little bushes grow up along the fence line, the weathering patterns on these storage tanks, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, like, okay, here's the, how wide the road is. We can see there's a gravel area in between the road and the building paint colors on the structures see how it's mostly you know pastel light colors not a lot of bright anything mm -hmm. there's also some gravel on the side of that road on the other side from the building right. between the fence right looking at this you should be able to pick out from here what those scenes were i was showing you earlier on the railroad the patterns in the sidewalks and the parking lots were developed from photos like this even though i'm not modeling these specific buildings so here, uh -huh. that shows us what brick color is typical in the area. This shows us, look at all these AC units on the roof and all of the vents. Um, this is a concrete block building, but it has this dark gray paint on it. Um, here's a parking lot that is fenced off, and it has a big uh, gate on rollers. Um, things like uh, where, do the, where do the weeds grow around this thing? This place is keeping it pretty clean, but there's still some weeds around the base of the building and in the park strip. Uh, weed pattern around here. Notice the different colors of the pavement. The road's yep. a different color from the parking lot, which is a different color from the parking lot on the other side of the street. So things you can do to weather uh, pavement color so they come out different. Uh, patterns of where do cars park so that they look plausible. Um, look at all the, the junk that's piled up here, but it doesn't look it doesn't look like garbage. It's just stuff that that building whatever that industry is, is using in its manufacturing or its shipping. So stacks of things on pallets, stacks of things that are getting ready to be moved in or out into a truck or into the building, uh, metal bracing hanging down from the structure to support an awning, the various roof vents so that you can figure out how to um, pick out parts. Yeah, the power lines along the street, how are they arranged, how far apart are the poles, um, where yeah. do the electrical wires go. There's another thing too that's in the picture, which is which shape of poles, because power lines and power poles are not the same everywhere. 
right that one that you have the cursor over yeah Yeah. that one that you had the cursor over doesn't exist where i live yeah these are really common here yeah yeah also look at the look at the parking lot in that other picture remember i was talking about how streets and parking lots never look perfect that's what i'm talking about see how faded all that stuff is and cracks everywhere i mean so don't make up out of your head how to put cracks in a parking lot. Use a photo and do them from that. That way they're guaranteed to look right. Look where the oil stains are. Yep. But, you know, other stuff like um, unloading platforms for this is some sort of chemical industry. I think they they're, it's food grade stuff. But here's where they're unloading trucks. The coloration and arrangement of uh, unloading things for tank cars slats in a fence here right all the signs and crap that are thrown onto this fence you could easily print these off on a color printer and add these to your model fence yep right the speed limit sign the bump sign the warning thing tile grout easy to manipulate when making road crossings yes it is it you can work if you can work with plaster you can work with tile grout it's pretty much the same If you mix it up uh, relatively thick, it goes on just like plaster and you can manipulate it. You can carve into it later. It's great for carving into later because it's the same color all the way through. Here's something else on the picture I'm noticing. On the left side, you see those bumper deals for cars so the cars don't run in? Look how they're not pure yellow. They're faded, right? They're faded. They're scraped. They're scratched. They have little squares of crap on them. I don't know what those are, but uh, somebody else... They're just bollards made out of uh, metal pipe that are filled with concrete. Right. They're, they're but, easy to make from styrene rod. Yeah. My point, though, is that I've seen stuff like that on layouts where the person just paints it yellow and it's pure yellow. It's not faded. It's just yellow. And it's like, it, unless I guess it could be that it just got painted on the layout. Yeah. Because those do, are they are new at some point, but I've never, are, yeah. I've never seen them in real life looking like they were just painted is all I'm saying. Oh, I have, but you know what, if you have a few that are painted brand new and a few that look really bad like this, that helps make the new ones look plausible. Sure. Uh, Sydney posted on there. Do I have a blog or website? The only blog that I would maintain is the one on model railroad hobbyist. So MRHmag.com, and then just search for my name and it brings it up. Yeah. Somebody else was asking if, if these photos are available online and the short answer is of course they are go on any map site. And go to oh, Street yeah. View, and you will find the same kind of photos everywhere. You can take these photos yourself, just driving around somewhere. People might think you're weird, but I've got a, I've got yeah, because all those are photos of mine. I've got a folder of Street View photos and Street Views of of industries, and I'll share these for you. Because you know, if you have a pile of these things around, you know, help. These help with your model work so readily that, um, and I just take a screen capture and then print the screen capture. Mm-hmm. And here. I could imagine that some people could even laminate that kind of stuff onto a, a piece of, uh, what's that, uh, foam back, foam yeah, board foam stuff. Board. And yeah. You can even use that as a backdrop in a city scene or something, right? Yep. So screen capture of a chemical business. Um, what color is everything painted? What's right. on the fence? What are the warning signs look like? What does the pavement pattern look like? Right. Pipes on the see, edge of a building. Air you conditioning. Can see this is, sorry, you can see this is straight off of Google Maps. I see the street view down in the bottom corner. So, yeah, you can get pictures of all this stuff easily. Someone's yeah. done all the work already. Right. So look at look at all the modeling ideas you can get from here. So some uh, BLMA or Walther's Jersey Barriers, some... You know, Walther's or uh, dimensional modeling concepts or ITLA or whoever's roof stuff, some Central Valley railing parts, pike stuff, walls, you know, Walther's electrical box over here, power pole from whoever. You know, if you if once you have the parts around, you can look at a building like this. And how do I model that? And You can just go into your pile of parts and start picking things out and use them. You know, random sidewalk through the middle of a parking area that's dirt. I like how that side of that building was painted two different colors. Right. You see that? <laughs> like, what's up with that? You know, well, there's a vent cut into the wall here. So it looks like they probably messed up this corner of the building and had to put something back over the top of it, th- throw their vent onto it. Yeah. 
there's a sign that was developed from uh, Street View. Like there's a sign on the side of a building, so I just cleaned that up because that's an industry that I'm working on. I, I think we might be getting an excuse to do another program, Rob, if you're ever interested. People want to see more of your layout. <laughs> yeah, sure. But, you know, how, how easy is it to go on Street View and start pulling down photos like this to use for modeling inspiration? Yeah, that's really the point, isn't it? I mean, you just have to be creative and think about it for a second, and you'll come up with these ideas, I think. Yeah, don't do it out of your head. Find the photos, work from the photos. Because you can make plausible... Look at how great this scene is here with the, the haze bumper over here and the pile of dirt on the building on the other side of the track there. Even something as simple as a knocked over street cone. See right? it next to the pickup? <laughs> right. <laughs> and one on top of the yeah, wood. Then somebody throws it onto the top of tie pot, the tie pile right here. And the, the, <laughs> the light pole, it's at a little bit of a funky angle. The antennas and uh, power feeds and the hydrant the the you know the water hook up here on the front of the building or if you're back that, in my fallout shelter signs stuff like that how about that staircase coming out of that building that's kind of cool that staircase is cool look at the the, the mid-century modern stuff okay that no, maybe nobody makes that but i can use this photo and fabricate the thing and solder up some wire looks like a little uh, awning over the door that's interesting too yeah that little awning over the door is pretty cool too and you know just like for what we talked about today stack up some styrene and make an awning do i build stuff for setup at shows i have in the past i haven't done it for quite a long time i concentrate on my uh, modeling at home that's a great sign look at that yeah, and, and look at this, the storm drain. Uh-huh. Setting at a funky angle. Yeah, instant background buildings, absolutely. But, you know, if you're coming up with something like this out of your head, how good is your memory at creating this? Where yeah. there's the crack runs all the way from the street back to the building. The I like drain, I like, you know? I like the brick face building with the awning, and if you look behind all that, it's just a regular... I don't know what that is. It's a cement. concrete block. Yeah. Just like this thing behind it. And yeah. look, there's the dumpster and the signs on the dumpster. <laughs> yeah, a way back machine. Wouldn't that be great? If you start searching for historical photos, you can find an awful lot online. Well, Short that's Shorty Photo Archive has some good stuff and um, historical sites for any given city tends to have a historical site or they have a Facebook page for people. Hey, if you grew up in such and such city, here's here's a blast from the past. And they'll have a photo from something that was old, like an old street view from that city from the 20s or the 50s. Yeah. You know, the Internet is full of inspiration that you're not going to get from looking at the pages of Model Railroad magazines. Yeah, a lot of places have historical societies that maintain libraries of that stuff. That's pretty cool. Little billboard, huh? Yeah, the billboard, what it's in the middle of and what's behind it, you know, apartment buildings and very simple stuff. A sign to put on the side of a, my uh, fertilizer plant from uh, the manufacturer of the fertilizer that I found oh. from, you know, like their billboard next to the building. I needed logos. to make a logo for a sign, and I couldn't find a logo, so I cooked up a logo out of, like, Microsoft Paint. But that's based off of, like, some of these images, like this P right here. I found that, you know, paste it into Paint and then clean it up. And then you can print it. You can do different sizes and shapes of that. This great industry here that has all the different um, colors and textures down the side. Look at the rust dripping down. Right. So how are you going to create that in scale just out of your memory? Look at these two things. Look like like Dr. Seuss tree things that are sitting at the front of the building here. Look kind of stupid. But look, look at this awning here. You know, if guys are going out on smoke break, they'll complain if they don't have an awning. So you always see that. Um, you notice the blue is different at yeah, the top? The different colors of blue. Yeah. I think these are plastic panels for see-through. So that the oh. light comes into the side of the building over the top of where there were windows. 
but the the pattern of vegetation along this fence to, is something that's great to model to break up the scene um, something that you probably wouldn't come up with right out of your head look at the, the manhole cover here Blair line makes stick on manhole covers you notice how it's off, it looks offset it might be an artifact of the it's lens artifact, but I think the lens yeah yeah someone's asking if this is from Google Maps or Google Earth it's Google yeah. Uh, Maps yeah it's Street View right street Google view. Maps take That's the where you... street view and drop him in yep I think you can click all the way down to it just by hitting the plus arrow on there too you can you can and you can blow it up and I like to do them with a kind of pulled away like this so that you can get the the big picture of what the scene looks like because so many of our railroads, we don't do a good job of modeling the pavement, the poles, the vegetation, and all the things that surround buildings. We cram everything in there. And look how open all these scenes are. This is an industrial area in a fairly large city. Next lots to a big space. Yard, there's lots of open space all around the tracks that we very rarely see modeled. This is that same industry from another direction. If you can find views from a bridge, you can look down on the roof. So this is an old building. You can see a metal rusted roof over here, and then we can see a brand new white, you know, vinyl membrane roof. Look at all the different colors of rolled roofing and shingles and crap that are thrown on this one for over the years. Every time they had a leak, they got a new color on the roof. Right, stuff to model. <laughs> and I, I just think we we are not in the habit of finding these things and using these resources. Yeah, I think a lot of people in the in the hustle and bustle of everyday life become less observant. Sounds yeah. like an excuse, but I think it's true. Yeah. And some of this stuff, we're just so used to seeing it for other things. Like we uh, will figure out what street view looks like. To, we know what the building looks like when you go there to get a pizza or something. And we don't realize that there might be a wealth of modeling information or in that in that street view. Look at the different colors on the side of that building. I'm noticing a lot of different colors on yeah, sides of buildings. Colors. And, and we tend to just take our models and paint it one big color and, and then it's done. Yeah. Look at this door, this roll door that's been replaced. Yeah, we, we wax nostalgic and we don't we don't appreciate what's here and how much of what's here today can remind us of what things used to be because things used to be worn out. Right. They'd have to replace stuff. But you know, we might not think of modeling a patch where some idiot backed a trailer into here a few dozen times and they had to repaint the building or when the bottom of this door got banged into too many times. They had to replace the bottom of the door. Drunk guy with the forklift. Yeah, the drunk guy. Yeah. You know, oh, Bob's having a Friday early and he rammed through the loading door, you know, so we don't think to model that. But, you know, how does a lawn look in front of an office? You know, yeah. does it, you know, it's manicured here, but it transitions across a concrete barrier into a street. And so all the, the streets got a bunch of crud growing into it from the sprinklers from the building. Oh, yeah, the Canyon gas station scene is on here. I've got the Canyon gas scene. We can we can bring that up. Okay, should um, I make this go away again? Oh, you did it. Hey, yeah, look at this I, guy, I man. Yeah, man, we're, we're doing that. We're getting this down, John, right? Uh, <laughs> so where's my gas station scene? Because it, it's, it's one of these that uses all this little stuff and brings it together. Because that was part of a presentation fairly recently. One of the people's commenting that a Bob running the forklift through the roll-up door would be a great animated scene for a layout. Yeah, yeah it would. You can even no, have uh, you can have an audio track for that of someone yelling at him. It's five o'clock early. Oh, look what Bob's doing. Anyway, here's the gas station they were talking about. Um, so notice this scene again. See how open it is. The spaces between the buildings. We need to oh, try to crap. add that. Yeah. Share. Dang it. You're so excited about the scene. You forgot to share it. Well, I didn't click enough things. It said it was sharing, but now it's not. Come on, share. Oh, here it comes. There it goes. Jeez, didn't did I didn't do enough clicks? So, open oh, yeah. space between all the scenes or the buildings in the scene, and without our photos, we may not realize how much open space is there. Little segment of sidewalk in front of here, segment of sidewalks around this building, um, arrangements of pot machines. Before um, you, yeah. Before you 
uh, scroll away from this. I want to say something about it. So finish your description, but don't click away yet. Okay. So we've got the uh, the biker guys that are hanging out here. Somebody's filling up with gas. Uh, there's the ice machine. There's the old style trash cans. There's a dumpster back here. You know, the sketchy guy that works at the store, he's got his trailer that he's living at out back. Um, the, the depot next door. You know, don't overcrowd the parking lots. Don't put too much in there. Our speed limit sign that's stuck directly onto the backdrop so it doesn't cast a shadow that makes the scene look odd. That's what I was going to say. Look at the backdrop and look at the road. And where does the road start and the backdrop end? And I took a picture of this very scene because I was so impressed with how good the road looks going into the background there because it's hard to see the difference. How do you match the paint like that? I mean, that's really the, all painted the same color. The yeah, that's the, and the tile grout are painted at the same time. Right. That's the trick, though, because I've seen backdrops and roads that go off into the backdrop that I don't know what they were thinking because they're different colors. And it's like, OK, that doesn't look right. Yeah, this it's, is tile grout, but it's painted. So when I yeah. did the backdrop, I just did. And, and when I drew the, the tar patches and stuff, I kept drawing the tar patches into the backdrop. So it's all done at the same time. Yeah. And the sides of the road in the foreground here also look very plausible. Yeah. They're and, not and you think that's from look at those street view photos right one side has grass the other side doesn't and you can see that there's a i mean that's yeah little details like that really do add a lot of plausibility yeah. the weeds along the side of this building and the the patched over windows on the side of this building street view stuff modern front wall on an old stone building with modern windows cut in and some trash cans and car stops you know pick that up off of the your street view that's where yeah. all this stuff comes from, you know. It's just scrounge photos and and find stuff that, you know, maybe you're not thinking of, but it, it's in the scene and model that. Do I do all that painting? Yes. That's one of the fun parts of the hobby for me is doing, you know, the backdrops and all that, tying all the scene together. Yeah. I mentioned that at the beginning of the show, Robert, that uh, Rob's, clinic at the convention was about backdrop painting and you go see his layout and you can see that uh, why he's doing clinics at the convention oh there's an extra oh boy <laughs> i'll put into that and learn how to do it right huh find somebody good <laughs> yeah excellent are you so, searching for another one? Should I take the no, picture down? Or? Take it down if you want. I was just okay. seeing if there are any further questions. If you don't have any further questions, it uh, looks like we're right on our two-hour mark where we wanted to be done. So Yeah, we can wrap this up. Uh, I will mention one more thing that was a takeaway for me just from the conversation when you were talking about that building that we started off with was I think it's important for people to decide how precise that they need something to be because that can save a lot of time. And if you're adding, you know, every single possible detail and you're trying to make it exactly to the size that it is in real life, I mean, there are times when that's applicable, but for a scene that's a fascia scene on, in the back of a town like yours is, you don't have to go to those lengths. And that's that point of diminishing returns I was talking about where, for me, um, you know, having all of that extra detail and all the extra work that was required in a big building like that, it may be the difference between me building it and me giving up on the project completely and not having it at all. Right. So having something that is, you know, maybe 90% of the way there that doesn't have every little tiny detail on it is preferable to having nothing because I've set a standard of perfection that's not achievable realistically. Exactly. So, we all have our time and, and patience constraints and, you know, we need to sometimes reel in our expectations and say, you know what, a scene that's 90% of the way there that's done may be preferable to having a hundred percent scene that you just can't get the ambition, the money, the time to build. Right. I mean, daunting tasks, if they're too daunting, tend to get abandoned by people that don't have an abundance of time anyway. Yeah, so, they do. Or, or patience, if you will. So they do. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Well, I think we'll uh, go ahead and wrap this then. Uh, there's another 
thing I should mention, uh, well, first of all, thank you, Rob, for sharing this. Uh, gonna try to apply some some pressure here and tell people if they wanna see more content like this from you specifically to put a comment in the comment section or in the chat, uh, because I think that this is, it's model gold. I mean, this is inspirational to me too. People are mentioning that word a lot in the chat right now. Uh, it's It's great, I mean, just, people can learn from what you've done over the years and what you've learned over the years. And I think that's something that's yeah, as long as people are willing to share that information, it's, it's worth giving it a platform on a channel like this. So oh, sure. I, I look forward to seeing whoever else that you can bring on here. Cause I, I love being inspired by other, other people because they've got ideas I haven't thought of. Yeah. So, everybody uh, has an idea, right? Yeah. That's one of the funny things that I've heard people that are really good at stuff comment on a lot which is oh i stole this from someone else you know oh, yeah. i freely admit how much i stole from uh, several people early in this presentation that certainly isn't all of them i steal ideas from so right you know find some yeah. people and follow them follow their blogs follow their facebook pages or whatever else they're posting and get that information and use it you know exactly so excellent cool well thank you so much rob and thanks everybody for watching uh Thanks to the people who have been moderating the live chat and giving us some great comments and questions. I think that makes the show a lot better as well. Thanks to our top secret producer sitting to my left here. That's also yeah, thanks, helpful. Buddy. Right? <laughs> Bringing up all the all the comments on the screen for us. <laughs> and uh, as I was saying before, if you're watching this on a replay, feel free to place a comment below and let us know what you think of the show. Like I said, it's at the beginning, it's the first one of its kind and Someday, Rob, you're going to be the answer on a Jeopardy question. Oh, no, my goodness. For who did the first show of uh, whatever this is, live model the railroading, model I guess. Railroading live. Yeah. I'm the guinea right? pig. <laughs> the guinea pig. Who the was the guinea, guinea pig? pig? Yeah. Unfortunately, Alex Trebek won't be asking the question, but I think we, that's, that's okay. As long as we get the, yeah, as long as we get the answer right, it'll be good. That's right. So, yeah. Uh, next week, I should mention just briefly – on uh, Saturday at 9 next week, we're going to have a Model Railroading with Jack Burgess episode where he takes us to all the stuff that you've never seen on his layout. That's a really interesting one. And I don't want to give away any spoilers here, but uh, we had fun making that one. All right. I guess that's it. Uh, thanks again, Rob. And we'll see everybody sometime soon. All right. Bye, John. <laughs>